people, would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God, which today comes from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Chapter 13, the first seven verses. Later on in the sermon, I'm going to share with you seven observations from this text. For now, I simply want to read it and have us hear Paul's writing to the Christians in Rome. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, musicians, and all who make this event work. Our sound team, these are all volunteers, and we could not do all that we do at Crossroads without the army of volunteers. Holy God, politics is a subject so many try to avoid speaking of. Grant us wisdom and insight now and a certain amount of boldness. We pray in the name of Jesus, King of Kings. Amen. John Jay was the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He wrote, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Chuck Colson, whom I had opportunity to meet a couple of times, founder of Prison Fellowship and a great thinker, said the popular notion that you can't legislate morality is a myth. Morality is legislated every day from the vantage point of one value system chosen over another. The question is not whether we will legislate morality, it is whose morality gets legislated. For that legislation of morality and that ruling of the nation, and I'm going to play my hand early here and tell you at the beginning of the sermon my basic thesis. I long to see Christians in political office. I want to see serious disciples of Jesus in office so that a biblical agenda might be advanced. I want to see righteousness and justice meted out in the halls of governmental decision-making 
and the righteous are more likely to do right. And the spiritually enlightened are more likely to bring enlightenment to City Hall and to the White House and to Congress. Augustine, in his wonderful tome, City of God, said, without justice, what are kingdoms but gangs of bandits? That's a great line. Without justice, what are kingdoms but great gangs of bandits? I want to show you the first of three videos I have for you today as part of this sermon. The AND campaign, A-N-D, is a nonprofit grassroots organization that seeks to educate Christians, particularly urban Christians, so that they can function effectively in the political arena. Watch this. The Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, then why not every man? Oh, did my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Did my Lord deliver Daniel, then why not every man? Oh, Christians, it's time for the church to come together and address the most pressing issues of the day. The AND Campaign is a coalition of urban, biblical Christians who believe it's time to rethink our tone, posture, and overall strategy when it comes to cultural and civic engagement. The AND Campaign is about living out the compassion and the conviction of Jesus Christ. It's about both social justice and biblical values. The truth of the matter is, traditionally, urban Christians haven't fit in comfortably with either side of the political or ideological spectrum. We haven't fit in with the right because historically they have rejected civil rights and they lack compassion. And we haven't fit in with the left either, even though people don't talk about it as much, because many of them have rejected classic values. But at the same time, we know that we have to be engaged in the most pressing issues of our day, whether it be mass incarceration or sanctity of life. We have to be involved, and we have to be involved faithfully. For too long, we've allowed other people to tell our stories. We've allowed politics, academia, and entertainment to inform our faith when we believe it should be the other way around. What does it look like for Christians to engage politics, academia, and entertainment for the glory of God? While we're caring for people and loving people the way God tells us to, we got to make sure that we don't uh, hold back from the standards that God has given us in His Word. The Ann Campaign wants to make sure that our movement is thoughtful about women's issues, and we want to affirm a biblical ideology of womanhood. Have you ever felt too progressive for conservatives, but yet too conservative for liberals? At the Ann Campaign, we're not trying to create a third party. You can rock with us and be a Democrat, or you can rock with us and be a Republican. We want to emphasize that Christians should transcend partisanship and ideology and come together on the core issues. Right now, the AND campaign is in our outreach and awareness phase of the organization. This is a very important phase because a group of people who are not organized and are not aware cannot be effective in the public square. We're in the process of creating AND campaign chapters all across the country. We're looking at eight major cities right now, and we need your help. Please let us know uh, what church you go to, connect us to your churches, connect us to your faith-based organizations, because we would love to partner with you. Now, if you want to connect with us, email us, engage at theandcampaign.com. And campaign, the future of Christian cultural and civic engagement. What would it look like if people of the light began to be the most dominant force in any municipality? What would happen if offices were held by people who loved Jesus Christ and who embraced his agenda for our world? It would look different. The political landscape would look very, very different from what it looks like now. Let's go to the biblical text that I read earlier, and I want to present 
seven observations about politics, about government from this text. And then I want to make a couple of other comments. J.C. O'Neill, in his commentary on the book of Romans, uh, says these seven verses, he's referring to Romans 13, 1 to 7, have caused more unhappiness and misery in the Christian East and West than any other seven verses in the New Testament. That's quite a charge. These seven verses have caused more unhappiness and misery in the Christian East and West than any other seven verses in the New Testament. There is no mention of Jesus Christ in these seven verses. I want to offer seven observations from Romans 13, 1 to 7. And they're pretty plain. I won't expand on them as much as simply declare them and make one or two uh, comments on them. But I won't unpack each observation. One, most of the time we are to submit ourselves to governmental authority. I say most of the time because there are times when the law of God is to be obeyed rather than the law of the land. I don't ever apologize for that. Most of the time, I am to obey the law of the land. But there are times when the law of God trumps the law of the United States of America. And I want to make sure I listen to God and obey God rather than humanity. But most of the time, I am to obey the law of the land. You can refer to Acts 5, a passage I read earlier in this series, uh, where the apostles are told not to preach Jesus anymore. They are imprisoned, and when they're let out of prison, and they, they were preaching Jesus even in prison, and when they were let out, the rulers said to them, didn't we tell you to, not to preach anymore in that name? And they said, yes, you did. But we must obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, you read it. It's a wonderful principle. Second observation, God is our ultimate authority. Second clause of verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. There is no authority except from God. God is our ultimate authority. Third observation, the governmental authorities that exist are appointed by God. The governmental authorities that exist are appointed by God. And you see that in the third clause of verse 1. Now you have to be careful here um, because this was written to Rome in a very specific context. There are general principles here, but we'd be, we'd be very inappropriate to take any one of these verses and on the strength of that verse, say that so-and-so is clearly sent by God and name a specific politician, a specific leader, and then say the next election cycle, so-and-so is clearly not sent by God. Well, either the office and the structure is authorized by God or it is not. But you can't decide based on the individual in that seat, I'm not going to pray or I'm not going to be subject or I'm not going to cooperate. It doesn't work like that. All authority is from God and the authorities that exist. And he's referencing structure, not individuals. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. Fourth observation, when one resists a God-ordained government, one is ultimately resisting God. Verse 2. Fifth observation, resistance against government brings judgment. Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I have known people, and so have you, who've made very bad decisions and then get angry because they wind up going to jail or wind up paying a penalty 
well, you, you got yourself into this. You made bad choices. Why are you not going to get mad at the government because you went to jail? You sent yourself to jail by resisting or by doing things that are inappropriate. Now, there are times, uh, and let's all be very, very honest, there are times when the authorities act inappropriately. And you can have a person not resisting at all, but accused of resisting and wind up in jail or wind up beaten, sometimes wind up dying, and they really were not resisting. There's a, an example of an authority or a person in authority going rogue. But Paul's point here is that if you constantly resist authority, there's a penalty, there's a judgment that comes on you for that. Sixth observation, most of the time, people committed to good need not fear government. Most of the time. I say most of the time because there are numerous examples uh, in which a law-abiding, innocent person has been harassed by and even killed by the government that is supposed to protect that citizen. I remember one time being stopped by a police officer, and actually it was because of a tail light that was out. I wasn't speeding. I don't do speeding. The officer asked me to pull over, and I remember it was at nighttime, and I was in an urban center. I wasn't out in the middle of nowhere, but I remember cracking my window. I didn't bring it all the way down. I thought, you don't need to be uh, reaching your hands into my car or just doing something crazy. So I rolled down the window just enough to speak to the officer. I was respectful, and the officer said, would you let the window down? I said, I don't, I don't feel safe enough to do that. What is the concern? And the officer told me his tail light was out, and that was it. I'm a good citizen, but I didn't want to give the officer any opportunity or temptation to not be a good officer. Most of the time, when you're committed to doing good, you need not fear the government. But we have been made uneasy uh, because of the behavior of a few rogue uh, people in authority. But this text says, most of the time, um, rulers are not a terror to people committed to good works. Verse 3, you know that I fly quite a bit, and I do not mind the government insisting that I go through a screening or a body scan or have my bag inspected. I have nothing to hide. I'm committed to being and doing good. The person who needs to fear is the person who has something to hide, the person committed to evil. Well, let me show it to you in this text. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authorities? Then do what's good, and you will have praise from the same. Behave yourself, and the authorities won't give you a hard time most of the time. I was in an airport in the baggage area, and there was a law enforcement officer with a dog who was sniffing the bags. And the officer said to me, is that your bag? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, my dog is picking up something. I said, well, your dog's got a faulty nose, but <laughs> whatever you need to do, do. And they had the dog pass over the bag. Another time he said, you're all right. And I said to myself, I know I'm all right. Because I'm doing good. I'm not out here trying to get away with anything. The person who must be afraid is the person who's not doing good, who has something to hide. That is Paul's point. He said, you don't, you don't need to live in fear of the authorities. Most of the time, you, you do not have anything to fear because you're doing what is good, and you'll have praise from those authorities. Verse 4, for he that is the authority is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. Be very afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on the person who practices evil. Let me give you a seventh and final observation before we move on. Submitting to 
and cooperating with good government is our responsibility. Obey the law. Pay your taxes. Be a good citizen. That's what verses 5 to 7 say. Sub submitting to authority, submitting to and cooperating with good government is our responsibility. Let us be good citizens. We, we don't have any reason to always be having a chip on our shoulder and always, you got to fight the man. No, no, most of the time you need to cooperate. Be, just be a good citizen. Stop trying to get away with stuff. Don't litter. Pay your taxes. Be a good neighbor. Every time I hear somebody playing loud music at 2.30 a.m., I think, aren't you at least concerned that there are other people that might be sleeping at this hour? C can you just be a good citizen? Do we, do we all have to hear your music at 2 a.m.? Why? Why? And why are your windows down? Why do I have to hear your music at this stoplight? I'm playing NPR. You don't hear my stuff. Just, you know, I, I, I'm courteous enough to leave my windows up. Do good, be a good citizen. Be a nice person. This is, this is essentially what the text says. Because of this, you pay taxes. Because of what? Because you're, you're interested in submitting to and cooperating with government, with authorities. So do what you're supposed to do as a citizen. Render custom to whom custom is due. Render taxes to whom taxes are due. This is very reminiscent of what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 22, rather, 17 to 21. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said, Whose image is on it? They said, Caesar's. He said, Render, therefore, to Caesar, you know the verse, the things that are and to God the things that are. Yeah. Here's Jesus teaching that one ought to be both a responsible believer slash disciple and a responsible citizen. Render to God the things that are God's. Be a responsible believer. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Be a responsible citizen. That is, engage on some level in government, in the political process. Now, politics has many definitions. I want to offer you a few from political scientists, those who teach politics. David Easton, and you can get these notes just right to Richard Allen Farmer, 1951. You'll have all the quotes and footnotes uh, from this message. David Easton. Politics is the authoritative allocation of values to the society. That, that's pretty good. Samuel Colonel wrote, The essence of politics lies in power, of relationships, of superordination, or dominance, and submission of the governors and the governed. Hmm, that's helpful dominance and submission of the governors and the governed. I'm sorry, that quote was from V.O. Key. Samuel Kernal says, politics is the process through which individuals and groups reach agreement on a course of common or collective action, even as they disagree on the goals of that action. That's good. The process through which individuals and groups reach agreement on a course, even if they disagree on the goals. Harold Laswell, the study of politics is the study of influence and the influential. That's good. I'd love to see more believers be in places and positions of influence. Merriam-Webster Dictionary offers a definition of politics that is not so complex at all. Politics is the art or science of government. 
And many Christians avoid speaking about politics. I don't speak about politics or religion. It just gets you in trouble. And they certainly avoid the thought of entering into politics. However, if we are called to influence our culture, and we are, if we're called to influence our society, and we are, isn't politics one primary field in which we can exert influence? In Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says to his followers, this is in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Wow. How heady is that? You, no pressure, are the light of the world. Then later on, Jesus says, and this is in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine in such a way that humanity may see your good works and, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Be a light and shine so brightly that people will observe your light and be pointed to God who gives the light. Wow. What a, what a privilege. What a possibility. Politics is an arena in which the light of the believer, the light of Jesus the Christ, is needed. Now, I, I can hear you. I, I hear you already. Politics is a cesspool, Pastor. Nothing but corruption in that field. Every one of them is corrupt. Before the election, they, gum, they work up their gums. After the election, they gum up the works. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Oh, what kind of difference could I possibly make? Well, we don't know. But I do remind you, you are the light of the world. Maybe if you got in there and started doing your job as a politician, you might make a profound difference. We haven't seen that many examples of that. People who get into office and then do their job. We haven't seen a lot of that, unfortunately. But what would happen if we took this seriously and started acting like the light? Went to Washington or went to our state capitals or went to our municipalities and began to work out in real time and practically what it means to be a light in darkness. Both Democrats and Republicans have their problems, you might say. All these statements have their place. I hear you. But if we don't engage our culture on the level where we get to have influence, we've missed a prime opportunity to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Now here in the USA, we have two parties. I'm aware that there's a libertarian party and a socialist party and a green party. However, those parties are not large enough to have gained any significant traction in any election. So if you vote for one of the candidates of the libertarian party or the socialist party or the green party, you're essentially throwing your vote away. They're not going to get enough votes to make any difference. So we have for all practical purposes, a two-party system. We have a Democratic Party and a Republican Party. And if we're honest, we like some items on both parties' platform. We vote usually according to our party affiliation, but we are attracted to some things across the aisle, aren't we? In the ideal world, we would vote for candidates, regardless of party, based on what they stood for. Maybe as believers we ought to, I don't know, examine the issues and the candidates and the intersection between the two and then make a prayer-saturated decision. Now that will require more work than most of us are willing to do. We just want to go in the booth and just pull down all the levers or uh, touch every button that has to do with our party and be done with it. And when the Bible states that government is of God, Romans 13, the Bible is not endorsing a party. It's endorsing 
the concept, the system of governed people, of authorities meeting out justice and righteousness. I want to urge us to be committed to principles rather than a person. In the summer of 2008, I was at a Bible conference in the Midwest. A woman asked me for whom I was planning to vote that November. I told her I intended to vote for the Democratic candidate. She was shocked. She was a Midwest Republican. And she was shocked. <laughs> Excuse me. She was shocked that this preacher, for whom she had great respect, at least that week, <laughs> could vote for a person who stood for abortion rights, women's productive, reproductive rights, and gays in the military. And I told her three things. I told her, number one, there are more than two items on the political agenda. There's much more at stake than abortion and gays in the military. That's all she could think about. And I said to her, secondly, we have had gays in the military since we've had a military. You don't think there were gay soldiers in the Revolutionary War? Are you that naive? We have had gays in the military since we've had a military. And then I told her, I said, I'm not voting for a pastor. I'm voting for a president. And I don't have to agree with him on every moral issue. I just think he has more to offer than the other candidate, and that's why I'm voting for him. Andy Stanley is the son of Pastor Charles Stanley here in Atlanta. He's the founding pastor of North Point Ministries, a network of churches across the Atlanta metroplex. He had an interesting take on uh, the political agenda and particularly uh, the election season. Watch this. Now, this is a longer video. So today we begin this three-part series designed to, to make you uncomfortable and hopefully better. It's entitled Talking Points, and I came up with the subtitle myself, The Perfect, The Perfect Blend of Politics and Religion. We'll see how perfect it is. That will be up to you. Now, um, I have found it very difficult to stay away from the topic of religion in church. But I found it very easy to stay away from the topic of politics in church. But whenever something Jesus says specifically intersects something that we're wrestling with in culture or wrestling with it specifically at a time like this in the life of our nation, I have to talk about it. Or I shouldn't say I have to talk about it. I get to talk about it. I look forward to talking about it because the words of Jesus are so relevant and they are so extraordinarily relevant with everything that's happening in our nation right now. And the division, that's no news, new news, right? The division in the church created by our current political context and climate intersects directly or intersects directly with something that Jesus taught. So we're going to look at it. And since we are a large and more and more diverse and geographically dispersed group of uh, network churches in the Atlanta area and now more and more all around the country, it's even more important for me to talk about this because we are set up to be divided because of what we're about to experience in the next few months. Now, I became... Um, I don't know, I don't want to say painfully aware, I became extraordinarily aware of the diversity of political views in our churches, actually the Sunday following the 2016 election. So here's what happened. So if you can go back in time, okay, it's the Sunday after the 2016 election, which meant um, churches in, in, you know, primarily uh, Republican counties, they sang so loud on that particular Sunday, right? I mean, they were just singing, right? And churches that were filled with primarily non-Republicans, they probably didn't even have music that Sunday. I don't know. I mean, it was, you remember, it was so emotional. Everybody was in shock and awe on both, you know, going both ways. And so, you know, we plan our services way ahead. And so we kind of 
you know, we got to Sunday and we just kind of did our regular thing. That's what we do. We just rarely interface with what's going on in culture unless it's, you know, something big and dramatic. And we just, you know, went with the program. So anyway, after the service, I'm sitting in my, my truck um, at one of our more suburban campuses. And for those of you who are watching from all over the country, we have like nine or ten uh, churches all over the Atlanta area. So sort of out on the outskirts. And I'm sitting there in the traffic, in park, just so you know, with my phone, scrolling through Twitter. And... Um, the cool thing about Twitter when you preach with one of these is you find out if people are paying attention to your main points. It's like, it's, it's so good. So I'm like, yep, yep, yep. Anyway, so I get a mention from an African-American woman who attended our church that's more toward town. Um, and, and this is essentially what her, her text said. She said this. She said, I came to church this morning looking for reassurance. I'm scared. And no one even mentioned the election. I feel abandoned by my church. And of course, as a pastor, really as her pastor, I felt terrible. So, but, you know, the Republicans who would read this, if you're a Republican, you would read this and you would say, and, and this isn't, I'm not, you know, this is going to be uncomfortable, so let's go ahead and be uncomfortable together. You're like, scared of what? We won. Scared of what? Now, if the Democrats had won the election, now that would have been something to be afraid of. That's what, you know, if you're a Republican, that's what you're thinking, Right. But she's thinking something entirely different. She has experienced this in a completely different way, right? Because nothing divides like politics. Because nothing divides like fear. And as you know, because you've been a victim of this, or maybe you've been a part of this, you can raise a lot of money peddling fear. You can't raise as much money if you're not peddling fear, right? I mean, the Republicans are going to take away your opportunity to vote. And the Democrats are going to take away your guns, you know, for $25 or $50 if you check $100, you know. You know, if the president is reelected, the, you know, the end of the world. If a socialist Democrat is elected, you know, it's the end of the world for $25 or $50 or $100, right? I mean, you peddle enough fear, you can raise a lot of money. I'm not trying to give you any ideas. I'm just telling you, it works. But here's the question. What, what exactly, just within the context of, you know, the United States of America, what exactly do we fear? And I tell you, I know the answer because the answer is the same for all of us, you know, in, at the macro level. It's this. It's loss. We fear something's going to be taken away. We, we fear loss. We feel the loss of control, the loss of opportunity, uh, the loss of the future of our children, the loss of our culture, the loss of our freedom, the loss of our progress because we've made progress in some areas, you know. White people, we fear what might happen. Brown and black people fear what has already happened. For them, it's not, you know, theory. For them or for you, it's history. And it wasn't that long ago. So there's fear for all of us. And it's the fear of the unknown. And you can't raise very much money if you don't peddle in fear. And so we're in this culture, we're in this season in the life of our nation where everybody's peddling in fear. And if we're not careful, we'll be, we will be victims of that. And not only will we be victims, we will be, this is what we're going to talk about, we will be divided. So back to my story. So I see this text, and I'm like, oh, no, you know, this, is there something? That's good. Stop right there. Thank you. In 1980, I saw a political cartoon in a newspaper that was most memorable. Republican Ronald Reagan was running against Democrat Jimmy Carter. In the first frame of the cartoon, a voter was going back and forth, Reagan or Carter, Reagan or Carter, I can't make up my mind. Second frame has a friend saying, yes, it is quite a decision to make, Reagan or Carter. Third frame has them agreeing that both candidates are imperfect, and they ask, what's the lesser of two evils? Final frame has one of them saying, the problem is not the lesser of two evils. It's the evil of two lessers. <laughs> and here we are more than 40 years later, after that election and after that cartoon, and we're in the same place. There are no perfect candidates. There are no perfect parties. We go to the polls in November, and we will probably vote our party and our ticket but there are some items for which your party stands with which you do not agree. And neither candidate will satisfy you 100%. It's the evil of two lessers. 
However, knowing that you want to be a responsible citizen and knowing that the concept of a well-ordered, well-governed society is of God, Romans 13, you will cast your ballot. Hopefully, we will define ourselves primarily not by a party, but by our commitment to be people of Jesus, to be light in darkness and salt in a putrid, tasteless society. And we will vote our conscience, and we will vote for something rather than against something. We'll try to make a difference. Now, neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party can save us. Only Jesus can save us. I want to make that clear. Sometimes you, you, can get, you can get it twisted and think that this candidate is your savior. Oh, this candidate is going to solve all the problems we have in the world. No, he or she is not. That is impossible. Only Jesus saves. Ideally, there'll be some elections in which you'll vote your customary party affiliation and its entire slate. In other elections, you'll seem like a traitor and you'll vote for the other party because you like and believe in what the candidate is saying. God, and this is a theological statement, but hear me, and if you've been sleeping, wake up now. This is, I, I got to... You have to hear this part. God is neither Democratic nor Republican. God is the ultimate independent. He doesn't need you to help him figure it out. And when we're doing our best thinking, we are defining ourselves not as Democrats or Republicans. We are defining ourselves as the people of God called to be light, and called to be salt without apology. And we are responsible citizens, and we are paying our taxes, and we're rendering to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and we're rendering to God the things which are God's, and we acknowledge that in a democracy there are winners and there are losers, both of which acknowledge the results of any election. This last video is a video by Pastor Greg Locke. He's the pastor of the Global Vision Bible Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Any Tennessee people here? Yeah. Yeah, you wanna, you're going to want to put your hand down for this one. This video is going to make your jaw drop. You're not going to believe this, but this is real. This is not a skit. This is not a comedy skit. This is an actual pastor on a Sunday morning, talking to his people. That's a, you can't and even please make sure the volume is up. On Amazon. Check me. You can check me while I'm preaching. Start Try to buy some infamil, sure see if you can. Is... Now I'm going to say something right now, going to make about maybe 10 of you mad. Now, I don't care if it makes all of you mad. We'll start over next week. You know, the Bible talks about church discipline, right? About kicking folks out that cause trouble. I'm almost going to say I'm about to the place. I am to the place. I'm to the place right now. If you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. They hate this nation. Get mad all you want to. I don't care if you stand. I don't care if you throw tomatoes, praise God. I'm about to throw a microphone up in his house. CNN can eat my dirty socks. You cannot be a Democrat and a Christian. You cannot. Somebody say amen. Yeah. The rest of you, get out. Get out. Get out in the name of Jesus. I ain't playing your stupid games. I'm going to the Supreme Court this Tuesday at noon, and I'm going to raise hell for the life of them babies. I'm going to raise Cain for them. Yes, I am. Yes, 
I am. I'm going to raise Cain for him. Right in Joe Biden's backyard. That's enough. Wow. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. You intelligent people. I would never use this pulpit to proclaim a party, a candidate. I never endorse candidates from this pulpit, never have, never will. You look at the issues. You look at the candidates. Vote is part of being a responsible citizen. In Australia, it is the law that you vote. You don't have an option. You must vote in Australia. You can go to jail for not voting in Australia. I've been there seven times to minister, and when they told me that, I said, are you serious? Yes, we have to vote. Voting is, is a part of your civic responsibility and privilege. I'm not going to tell you what party to align yourself with. You're intelligent enough to figure that out. But God help us if we start raising a party or a candidate to the place that only God should occupy. God help us. And what would happen if thinking lovers of Jesus got engaged in the political process, got in office, and began to make a difference from the inside? What would happen if we took seriously what it means to be part of that group of people that makes laws, that makes decisions, that figures out how to allocate the resources of this very wealthy country. God is neither Democratic nor Republican. God is the ultimate independent. And he's calling on you to respond to him in his great grace and his great love. Let us pray. O holy God who does rule the universe, please check us. We go off in ranting and raving far too often. May we give ourselves to being good citizens, responsible voters, and ardent lovers of Jesus the Christ, that you may be pleased. Use us, O oh Lord, we pray, to make our country, our cities, better. May we learn what it means to be the light of the world. And may we shine more brightly because we follow thee. In the name of Jesus, the light of the world, we pray. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand as we sing this closing hymn. And may God open our eyes. This is a, a prayer.